This is totally useless information with Nick and Roy. Listen, laugh, and learn. Who invented the H E I R air conditioner? Mm, and I'll tell you about a British pharmacist and his dirty mixing stick. Hi, I'm Nick. <laughs> Don't you notice how I rhymed that? I'm his dirty mixing stick. I'm Nick. And I'm Roy. We scour the internet and other sources to find useless information just for you. Plus, we will answer your questions from our mailbag segment. And the headline from news from around the world, she put a hit on Grandma. <laughs> totally useless information. It's everything you never needed to know. What you get Innovation. Out. Ideas. The Totally Useless Information Podcast presents Inventions. Oh, yeah. They were saying, what'd you get it with the exploding can of Insure? <laughs> well, you have to tune in to find out later for the news from around the world at the end of the show. A British pharmacist. I'm going to give you the teaser right off the top because you're thinking, what the heck is a dirty mixing stick? Might as well just satisfy your curiosity. In 1826, John Walker noticed a dried lump at the end of his stick. While he was what? <laughs> While he was stirring a mix of chemicals, when he tried to scrape it off, sparks oh, sparks hurts. ensued in flame. Jumping onto this the discovery, Walker marketed the first friction matches as friction lights and sold them at a pharmacy. His pharmacy, actually. The initial yeah. matches were made of cardboard, but he soon replaced those with three-inch long hand-cut wooden splints. The matches came in a box equipped with a piece of sandpaper for striking. So what was his name? John Walker. So John Walker had a three-inch dirty stick. <laughs> he did. And sparks ensued, and, and then they caught fire. <laughs> yeah. then they caught like fire. rubbing it till it caught fire. That's right. There you go. Wow. See? Very interesting. Nick. Thank you so much for that. You're very welcome. The president of Nintendo Game Company was walking down the hall one day and noticed his janitor was playing a game that he created on a basic computer. Now, Nick, you know what basic computers basic are. Basic computer right? language, line yeah. And yeah. line 20, line whatever. Yep. You well, know, this guy created a basic computer game, and the president of Nintendo was so impressed. He hired him. He would go on to create some of the iconic games for Nintendo, but he also invented the Game Boy for Nintendo, which still nowadays is still hot as anything. Yeah. And what was his... I guess he cleaned up. <laughs> I was just going to say, he cleaned up. There you go. See? Great minds think alike. We'll let you know when that starts. Uh, we can thank a French artist and chemist, Edouard Benedictus. Did Benedictus have a dirty stick? He didn't. While in his lab, a glass flask dropped and broke, but it didn't shatter. Benedictus realized that the interior was coated with a plastic cellulose nitrate that held the now harmless broken pieces together. He applied for a patent in 1909 with a vision of increasing the safety of cars, but manufacturers rejected the idea to keep the cost down. It was too expensive to manufacture. However, eject or eject. Well, they were eject. ejected and then they were rejects. Up. Yes. The glass became standard for gas mask lenses for World War I. Hmm. With its success on the battlefield, the automotive industry, guess what? By the 1930s, they said, what a great idea. And most cars were equipped with glass that didn't splinter wow. into jagged pieces upon impact. American psychologist B.F. Skinner, and I'll let you know right off the bat that this is my teaser of the day. <laughs> okay. American psychologist B.F. Skinner, um, he had a dirty stick as well, invented a temperature-controlled baby crib. It was a square wooden box with some windows in it, and he put an air conditioner and a heater in it and a controlled thermostat device. He called it the Air H. I H E I R conditioner, the air conditioner, meaning your children, your heirs, to, would be placed into the box, and that box then would have a constant climate controlled environment. Anyone who's experienced the joy and convenience of losing a piece of luggage while traveling knows that a luggage tag is an essential, as essential as the suitcase itself. New Brunswick's John Michael Lyons. Again, a guy with three names. Someone with three names is really smart. Oh, they all have three names. John Michael Lyons reduced levels of, quote, travel anxiety 
with the first baggage tag in 1882, and it contained information about the point of departure, destination, and the owner, the luggage tag. I would like to have that, like if I invent something famous, I'm going to say my name is Richard Harry Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Andreas Celsius, you know the guy, he invented a temperature gauge, which he called the Celsius gauge. Oh. And he put um, boiling points and freezing points on the Celsius gauge. All right. But he made it very confusing. So when he died, another scientist named Carl Lin Linaus, L-I-N-N-A-U-S, probably from Deutschland, <laughs> he changed it from the very confusing way it was to boiling at 100 and freezing at zero, and everything else was in the middle. So he didn't even wait for Andreas to get to like 15 degrees Celsius. No, he died and he instantly changed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He couldn't wait for the body to get cold. Is that what you're saying? Because <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the hell Celsius is. But well, it's okay. Well, 15, uh, here's, here's an easy uh, guide for you. 16 Celsius is 61 Fahrenheit. Oh, okay. 28 degrees Celsius is 82 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what it is today. There you go. Yeah. Well, you're in Florida. I'm in Toronto. So I'm, uh -huh. yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> the revolving door. In 1888, Theophilus Van Kennel invented the revolving door, a design that characterized the entrance of modern skyscrapers. We've all been through revolving doors. Uh, the revolving door helped alleviate several problems. It served as an airlock, preventing the rapid influx of cold air celsius air into warm buildings on chilly windy days so it served as like an energy conserver because all of the cold air didn't rush in so that revolving door helped control the climate could you imagine he didn't call it the revolving door and named it after himself and the bellhop said to all the ugly women you go through the kennel door <laughs> <laughs> ouch <laughs> rough <laughs> god i wish i had that job yeah <laughs> Oh, yeah. And bark and bark while you go through. Okay. The Gatling gun, pretty much the first machine gun uh -huh. that was ever invented, was by a Civil War doctor. Oh. Right? This is cool. So he realized that if he put the barrels together, that he could fire the weapon simultaneously just as a barrel met the, the bullet, it would fire. And, of course, he was firing like 16 barrels kept going around in a cylinder all right what's really interesting about this guy his name is richard jordan gatling he also invented the screw propeller for a steamboat before the gatling gun and he also invented the rice mowing machine all of his machines were cylindrical devices that spun around in circles Okay. So this guy had this inept ability to create objects from this circular cylindrical spinning device. Crazy, right? Yeah. You know, I had a cylindrical device once, but I bought it at one of those naughty shops. But that's another story for another day. Welcome to the Totally Useless Information Fashion Show. I loved my pair of Argyle socks and I looked at them and I said, where did Argyle socks come from? Mm, good question. The Well, thank you. The Argyle pattern derives from a tartan of Clan Campbell of Argyle in Western Scotland. There you go. It was used for kilts and plaids and from the patterned socks worn by Scottish Highlanders since at least the 17th century. They were generally known as the tartan hose, but they changed it to Argyle socks. In the year 200 AD, the Romans invented something for the soldiers. Uh -huh. And it became the norm from that day on. It was a left and a right shoe. Before that, people just must have walked around in circles. <laughs> Before that, they had one shoe for the left foot and the right foot. It oh. was just one sole, one shoe. The Romans decided it was easier to create a shoe for the right and the left and would make you faster and sturdier and so on. And they, that, so from 200 AD on... You have a left and a right. Okay. A left and a right. Now, did they have to put L for left and R for right? Did they have to put them on the shoes so they know which one? They was probably did it in Roman numerals. They did, yes, of course. Instead of writing left L and R, they wrote LV and Louis Vuitton patented them. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 
pantyhose. I don't know if uh, the last time you wore a uh, pair. I of love them, Nick. They yeah. make my skin feel good. Well, you have to thank Alan E. Gant because he mm -hmm. was on a train with his. Where's them too? No, well, he, well <laughs> not quite, but close. He was on a train with his pregnant wife on an overnight train to North Carolina from New York in pantyhose. No, 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 not yet. Hold on. His wife he said, I, "I can't stop wearing them." No, but, go ahead. But his wife, his wife Ethel, because back then that was her name. A very popular name. <laughs> yeah, very popular. Cows, name. cows, and ugly men. Right. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> his wife Ethel told him that this would be the last trip she'd be going on before the baby was born because she was rather uncomfortable managing the combination of thigh-high stockings, a girdle, and a garter. Ah. Oh. Yes. Gant was inspired and asked his wife to, when they got home, he asked his wife to stitch a pair of stockings onto panties and try them on. She didn't hate them, so Gant took the prototype to the clothing mill where he worked and found a practical way to knit pantyhose on hosiery machines with non-stretch yarn. The process was one of trial and error. At first, they came up to your gin. Which, mm -hmm. is how, which is how Roy probably wears them. You could get your whole body in it. That's how stretchy it was. But they learned to put it some... It makes eating a little tough, but go ahead. It does. They it really works well when you're robbing a bank, though. <laughs> He's never done that. And the, eventually they learned how to... Allegedly. They did learn, however, to put some control into them, like a control top, and they would fit at your waist. So thank you. You know an yeah. awful lot about pantyhose. I'm, I'm no. starting to get a little nervous this, here. This is according. No, no. Are you Being calling? that it's a Zoom thing, I don't know what Nick is wearing below the, below the belt. Nick and Roy will continue with totally useless information. We're back with totally useless information with Nick and Roy. Listen, laugh, and learn. Okay, I have to share some personal information. I cannot stand touching pantyhose. I do not no. like the, the, the texture, the feeling on my fingers. I just can't. I love them. Yeah. Well, good for you. <laughs> love it. Love pantyhose. All right. <laughs> Do you need a minute? Okay. Kind of well, weird. you know what? Listen, That's while kind of while you need a minute, I'll just remind the audience to go to nickandroy.com, click on contact us, send mm -hmm. us an email, go to nickandroy.com and click on birthdays, and we can uh, record a wonderful, oh. a unique message for your loved one on their birthday. You get to hear an actual um, prototype uh, birthday that we've done for people, and we put one on there so you can hear it. It's awesome, awesome, awesome. You get the both of us doing totally useless information for people's birthday. For them personally, on the day that they were born, it is the coolest, best gift, especially for somebody that's got everything. Trust me, they will be telling everyone that you gave it to them. NickAndRoy.com so, slash birthdays. So are you feeling you better? like a big shot. Well, you are a big shot. So are you okay now? You feel better now that you've uh, removed your pantyhose? Yeah, yeah. I loosened my pantyhose up. China now sends more than 90 million yards of cotton to the fashion industry every year. Yard by a yard square. 90 million. Hey, we thank all of the listeners who are listening to us on the iHeartRadio network. We are on News Talk 1010 in Toronto, CFRA in Ottawa, CFAX in Victoria, CJAD in Montreal, CKLW in Windsor, CKTB in St. Catharines, and now in Kelowna, AM 1150. So, A. A. That's a right. AM. AM, A. <laughs> French cuffs. Okay, French cuffs on a shirt were not invented by the French. What? French cuffs were never part of the French culture. Rather, they were wow. invented by the British. What the hell is it with the French? They luck out. The Belgians made French fries. Right. Okay, so, you know, they didn't have to do anything. They just let other Who made the bread then? The Dutch. <laughs> the, Dutch. Ah, the, the Dutch. The shirts. Ah, past the Dutchie. The, <laughs> on the left hand side. The shirts would come with buttons along the sleeves that helped them fasten their cuffs at the length that they liked. This mm. further made it easy and it made its way. It, it was easy to get its way through Europe and become well known as French cuffs. So they took all the credit, but it was really a Brit it was the British who invented it. Wow. Women's clothing was not always so colorful. So in the 19th century, women wanted colorful objects that would catch the attention of men. 
kind of like you know how birds flash their colorful feathers. Well, especially peacocks, right? They they spread their right. their feathers. Well, I mean, all animals they flex their colorful areas to attack, you know, to either attract a male or a female mate. Well, women felt that co- their clothes were were not bright. They were usually white or dark, mm-hmm. and they wanted something, so they created an object that they could hold, and it becomes the handbag. They would crochet fancy colored objects on it and so on to attract the man's attention. The handbag was then created. Most of the time, they were very colorful. There you go. See? Listen, laugh, and learn here on Totally Useless Information with Nick. We're so stupid. A simple handbag caught our attention. (laughs) That's right. We're colors. Look at the flashy colors. Ooh. We didn't Uh, realize that she was wearing an armored girdle, uh, (laughs) garter belts. There's all kinds of crazy Marquis de Sard devices. <laughs> <laughs> if she wore a guard belt, how does she get pregnant? That's what I want to know. Going back to the uh, the inventor of the pantyhose, right? Because the guard belt didn't really uh, block anything, Nick. It was just the object that held up the pantyhose. Oh, I've been using it all wrong then. <laughs> <laughs> They're not hats, Nick. <laughs> Yeah, it's good to know. Thank you. Good to know. They're not hats. Um, and I got a, I had a lot of girlfriends that like to buy fancy underwear. So let's go on. <laughs> it's not a oh hat. My, God. my wife spends a lot of time at Victoria's Secret, but let's go on again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she keeps, well, I walked by the uh, uh, Victoria's Secret store and said, bras half off. Okay. <laughs> what do you call those shoes that uh, have the holes as a design on top? Are they called brogues? Uh, yes. So yes. brogues were used to drain water from the shoes. While we consider the perforations to be a design element, the hole pattern on the brogues were originally used to trudge through wet surfaces as the Ooh. holes in the shoes would let the water out. They were mainly used as outdoor shoes as opposed to wearing them just for work today. Brogues. Right. And, and brogues were attached to, sewn on to, an Oxford which is a man's shoe, and we learned something today. An Oxford is any man's uh, dress tie-up shoe is considered an Oxford. They could be pointy, they could be straight in the front, but if they have that, what they call a wingtip design, it's normally called a brogie. There you go. So I do know something about fashion. You do, a little bit. Okay. Let's go on to some more women's clothing, (laughs) shall we? Okay. Sure. Valentino yeah. Garavani. What a great name, yeah. right? I want that to be my name. What's your name? Valentino Garavani. Yes. <laughs> Better known by one name, Valentino. Mm-hmm. Okay, trust me, my wife knows. She's got plenty of the bags and <laughs> shoes. Never leaves his home without these five things. All right. His five precious pugs. Valentino goes everywhere with them. <laughs> He never leaves without them. He has five pugs, takes them everywhere. Hotels, planes, restaurants, takes them inside. So I, I take things with me all the time, but it has nothing to do with the pugs. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with the garter belt in my head. Well, in high school, Nick was known to take a few dogs out to eat. <laughs> <laughs> They were very nice women. You're listening to Totally Useless Information with Nick and Roy. Step right up here. Step right up, folks. Don't be shy. Move it. Totally Useless Information with Nick and Roy present Games People Play. Speaking of Mr. Potato Head, on April 30th, 19... (laughs) Great segue. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) In April, on April 30th, 1952, Mr. Potato Head became the first toy advertised on television. The campaign was also the first to be aimed directly at children. But before this, commercials were only targeted at adults, including toy advertisements. The commercial revolutionized marketing and caused an industrial boom. In fact, I have a sample of one of those commercials. It's Mr. Potato Head and his bucket of parts. Like smart faces make a like smart eyes. It's Mr. Potato Head and his bucket of parts. Pockets are bad and brandy. What a different time. Mr. Potato Head what a and his bucket time, of parts. Right? New from play school. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. New from play school. It, it's a Mr. Bucket, Potato Head. Yeah, it's a bucket of parts. Battleship, it, by the way, it didn't come with the head originally. It just came with the pieces, That's and you right. would need a potato. Remember we had that on the show? You That's right, and we had Why vegetables. your own potato. That's right. 
there you have it. And then um, probably after a few good hours of play, you and four friends, then uh, mom made mashed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, probably. Yeah, yeah. Battleship is an iconic board game. Yes. Pretty much everybody knows or has heard of the Battleship game. Yeah. And it was first a board game, a, a real literal cardboard back board game. Okay. And it was made into a video game later on and also the plastic version that you stuck the ships on that we would probably be more familiar with. Mm -hmm. But did you know that the original Battleship, the one that was the fold-out cardboard version, also included land areas that you could use? I don't know what the ships were doing on land, <laughs> but <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they gave you a tank or two. I don't know. A what? Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> hopscotch. The game of hopscotch began in ancient Britain during the early Roman Empire. By the way, I have to thank one of our researchers, Mark, for this information because he helped us research some of the information here on totally useless information. Another one on the payroll. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> of nothing. Hopscotch began in ancient Britain during the early Roman Empire. It has been said that the game was invented to train Roman soldiers and the courts spanned over 100 feet. The hopscotch court was used to help the Roman foot soldiers to improve their footwork as they ran the course in full armor. My guess, is, though, is that maybe that's where the uh, the obstacle course kind of came to be maybe later on. This is my guess, but uh, hopscotch was a game that the Roman soldiers used to train. It would also scare the enemy, too. Could you, could you imagine they're going down this 100-yard thing going, My sister says don't go. Okay. <laughs> That'll work, yeah. <laughs> like, let's get the hell out of here. Yeah. <laughs> and they won the war. Mm -hmm. Nick and Roy will continue with totally useless information. To access the full library of episodes, visit nickandroy.com. You're listening to Totally Useless Information with Nick and Roy. Listen, laugh, and learn. Have you ever played the game Boggle? Yes, I have. It boggles my mind every time I play it. No, I have not. Have you really? Yeah, I have, yeah. I it, have never played yeah, it. Yeah, it's but in you... order to stop. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, isn't that the game where uh, it's like little cubes with letters on them? Yes, I the don't know the game. I just found this fact and found it very interesting. Okay. What about Boggle? In order to stop stop boggle players from using a certain swear word the letters f and k only appear once on the same cube meaning it's impossible for both to be both be played at the same time so you could never mm -hmm. spell out the word f with a k at the end shut the front door Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty good at um, those kinds of games. Actually, the word jumble, I, honest to goodness, the letters just jump out at me. Yeah. A sweepstakes is a, is, we've heard of sweepstakes all the time. You know, a type of contest where a prize or prizes may be awarded to a winner or winners. Mm -hmm. The sweepstakes began as a form of lottery that were tied to products sold. So in response, the FCC and the Federal Trade Commission refined U.S. broadcasting laws creating anti-lottery laws. So under these laws, sweepstakes became strictly no purchase necessary to enter to win. So often you hear those those disclaimers, no purchase necessary. A purchase Isn't will, that redundant? Well, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> they bought it all right. A purchase will not increase your chances of winning. Today, sweepstakes in the United States, at least, are used as a marketing promotion tool to reward existing consumers to draw attention to a particular product. So by definition, the winner is determined by pure random chance rather by skill. This show brought to you by Publishers Clearinghouse. <laughs> That's right. Now, what's interesting <laughs> is up here in Canada, you can't win anything unless you answer a skill testing question. Really? Yeah. Is that the truth? It is. Hmm. So in order for me to figure that out, I had to add three. The Canadians seven. think they're smarty pants. That's yeah. why. Well, we invented, <laughs> we, we adopted the Celsius uh, scale. So, yes, we are smarty pants. <laughs> Down here, they're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what I ain't answering your question. Yeah. A traditional Connect Four board. You've seen Connect Four? Love the game. Mm-hmm. It has 4,531,985,000 possible positions. Give or take a position or two. Okay. <laughs> Can you imagine? Uh, 
by the way, the player that goes first has an, has an, a chance of winning 100% of the time if they know how to play. Connect four. Mm-hmm. I played it, but not, you know, I didn't, I played it. Yeah, just I think kid. an adult version of that is connect for play, and it had many other positions. I believe, too, that there's a dating site called Connect Four. <laughs> <laughs> connect for who? It's where friends meet other friends, oh. if you know what I mean. <laughs> it's like Connect Four. Connect for who? For you, you dummy. Okay, hold on. Let me just uh, shake my magic eight ball here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you listening to Totally Useless Information with Nick and Roy? Let me shake the eight ball. Yes, I am. Okay, let me shake the eight ball again. Who invented the eight ball? A bookman of Allaby Crafts Company of Cincinnati introduced the Magic 8 Ball in 1946. The size of the overgrown softball with a flat spot that let it stand as a desk on the desktop as a paperweight. So Magic 8 Ball would respond to questions with 20 phrases framed in a triangle in a round window. What's the secret of this toy? The black Magic 8 Ball was decorated with the number 8 in a white circle. It houses 20-sided plastic polydrons that floats in a diluted liquid. It was simple to play, but millions of people have purchased their Magic 8 Ball during the last seven decades, but the toy is still gaining popularity, but initially it was marketed as a paperweight. Huh. And so they remarketed it to children, and now it's a toy. But originally, the Magic 8 Ball was a paperweight. Wow. And, and that was so long, Nick, I think he invented the game uh, in shorter amount of time. But... <laughs> okay. Yeah. I thought you were going to read all 20 uh, hexagonal uh, <laughs> phrases. <laughs> all right, folks, I won't bore you. Goodbye. Captain Cook. Yes. The famous explorer. Yes. He played a game very similar to Connect Four. Oh. Yes. He called it his cabin mistress. Oh. And he played the game almost every single day while he was at sea. It kept him sane, I guess. But he called it his cabin mistress. And his pet name for his wife was Candyland. Oh, no. <laughs> Not Candyland. Uh, we thank you very much for joining us week after week. We really appreciate it. We are in over 62 countries. And without your support, well, we would just be doing something else. But we thank you for listening. Where do they go, Nick? You're listening to Totally Useless Information with Nick and Roy. And if you go to our website, nickandroy.com or http colon double slash www. Okay, nickandroy.com is all you need to know. Nickandroy.com. You click on <laughs> Connect Us and you send us an email. And we might pick your email. What's in the mail? Lots and lots of email this week. Thank you, folks. Thank you so much. Monica from Mexico City, Mexico. I like that. Mexico City, Mexico. She says, hola. <laughs> <laughs> did she put exclamation points upside down? She did. She okay. did hola. Yeah. All right. She says, the show... Not yours. Bad English. The show has helped me learn so many things, and you have helped me learn the English. <laughs> really, really goodly. <laughs> Monica, sounds like me and Nick speaking. <laughs> we love you in Mexico. I guess if uh, when we went down to Mexico, we're okay, but if she came here, it wouldn't be so good. No. <laughs> Not goodly. We love you in Mexico. I have many friends that listen. Gracias. Well, I say de nada. Yes. You say de nada. I say de Niro. Uh, Anne from Port Hope, Ontario writes, Dear Nick and Roy, we love listening to your show every week. We truly look forward to it. Now that you're on the radio, we enjoy it even more. Well, thank you. As we mentioned earlier, you were on the iHeartRadio Talk Network. Here's my question. I use different fonts when I type out my emails. Where did the name of fonts come from? And by the way, we use Times New Roman all the time. Mm. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Anne, from Port Hope, Ontario. Uh, there's a difference between a typeface and a font. The font is a small part of a typeface. If you're talking about Times New Roman, Times New Roman 12-point bold italic is the font. And the typeface is the collection of all the fonts that make up the entire Times New Roman set. I use Verdana, by the way, which in 1994, Microsoft released uh, Georgia, which is another um, 
another yeah, font. Popular. But Rodana, all three of those typefaces were designed by Matthew Carter. And uh, Tahoma, by the way, was named after the M- Mount Rainier in Seattle, which was called Tahoma by Native Americans. Rodana. I used to tell my driver when I was drunk. <laughs> oh, Tahoma. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going? Tahoma. Tahoma. There you go. And Verdana is a combination of the word verdant, which describes something green or lush. Mm-hmm. Like a plant and the name Anna. Is this another eight ball thing? No, it's not, but that's it. Anyway, you know, I think Times Roman and Ariel are the two most used fonts. Yes, it, the Times New Roman was created in 1931, and its mm-hmm. name makes sense because when you realize it, because it was designed for the British newspaper, The Times. Mm-hmm. 1931. Yeah, Times, I believe Ariel are the two most used fonts of all time. Yeah, what of the all Times. <laughs> of all times, yes. <laughs> of all times. So once again, you go to our website, nickandroy.com, and you send us an email. And now, for something completely useless. We talked about Dr. Percy Spencer. And I know the name is going to ring a bell to you, but I don't know if you remember who he was. He was the scientist who walked past the device that they were working on at Raytheon with a chocolate bar in his pocket. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it melted, and he realized that the magnetron that was working in the box would later become the microwave. That's so he right. The microwave. Mm-hmm. But you know how we always come up with facts, and we, we kind of, me and Nick, sometimes we question things ourselves. I was eating a thing of microwave popcorn, and you know how good it smells when it yeah. comes out? Oh, yeah. And I said, who the hell invented microwave popcorn? So I look it up, and I see this patent, and on the patent, the name, Dr. Percy Spencer. Oh. <laughs> so, so the guy who invented the microwave. Right. He was a brilliant man. He freaking invented all that goes in the microwave. Nick and Roy will continue with totally useless information. Totally useless information with Nick and Roy continues. Listen, laugh, and learn. Do you know what a grabotologist is? A grabotologist. No, I don't. I mean, it sounds like something you might grab, but no, I guess that's not it. Well, no. It's not someone that goes around grabbing women or or experiencing thong. the feeling of thong skin. Nope. It's a person who collects neckties. Oh. They are called grabotologists. Oh. So if you get anything from the show today, walk around saying, do you know what a grabotologist is? And make believe you're smart. <laughs> yes, just make believe. <laughs> Men didn't wear underwear until the 17th century. Women didn't. I'm not wearing them now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> In fact, I'm not wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so we should give you a $500 fine or 60 days in jail. Um, women. Hey, listen, Nick. Yes. I'm going to stop you for one second. Yes. I thought of another ingenious idea that I'm going to share with the people here. Okay. I call it the Zoom suit. What it is, is literally just a cover in the front of you that looks like you're wearing a jacket, a shirt, and a tie. Right. But literally, you could be completely right. naked. It's more or less like one of those huggy blankets that you just <laughs> throw over you while you're on a Zoom call. It makes it look like you're dressed. Men didn't wear underwear until the 17th century. Women didn't bother wearing underwear until 1800. A former infantry soldier and medic gives a plausible explanation. He writes that when on the field, soldiers sweat a lot and can't take showers for days. Their uniforms are loose enough to allow for ease of movement so they don't wear underpants in order to prevent skin eruptions and fungal infections. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, that's where the term commando comes from because apparently it's the soldiers who went without underwear for the very reason we just explained. Uh Okay, that's a good one, folks. You heard it here. You're listening to Totally Useless Information with Nick and Roy. If you go to our website, you're going to look at the top and it says birthdays. And you're wondering, what's that all about? If you have someone in your life that you'd like to send a very special birthday gift, this is for you. What is it? It's the Nick and Roy's birthday salute to your loved one. What you can we- hear a sample right on the website. Go on there, folks. If you have somebody that you say, well, they have everything. I don't know what to buy them. This is the perfect gift. Every person that's got one for somebody, they end up getting them for someone else. 
because they just loved it so much. We have so many comments from the people. We've done we've done hundreds of them now. It is insane. It's fantastic. People cry all the time, and they really and they say, "How did you know that that was the particular you know whatever the fact is?" Because yeah, we put together a little small little totally useless information program for your loved ones. So go to nickandroy.com slash birthdays, nickandroy.com slash birthdays to get yours today. Uh, on the <laughs> show today, we talked about inventions. We gave you some fashion tips, and we played some games. It's time for the news. Oh no. From around the corner and around the world, this is TUI News. A TikTok user named Madison has caused a stir on, on social media after claiming that her aunt tried to, quote, put a hit on her grandmother to prevent her from, a, to, from attending her son's wedding. She tried to kill the grandmother, have that, the grandmother off. That's right, so that she doesn't attend her son's wedding. In the video on the on the well, TikTok. First things right. first, Nick, how much? No. <laughs> so on the video platform, Bloody she's me. Madison allegedly says, All right, buckle up, here's some tea about my family. I didn't realize that tea meant gossip, but whatever. Here's some tea. Tea means talk. Okay. Is that what that means? I think so. Sure. Listen, laugh, and learn. Unless you have a crumpet, then it's usually a liquid <laughs> beverage. Okay. My cousin got engaged a year ago while creating the guest list for the wedding. He said he was going to try to invite my grandma, who's 85, and my aunt, my cousin's mom, not my biological aunt, okay, whatever, decided that she didn't want my grandparents to be invited, and that would be her in-laws. So instead of voicing that opinion, she decided to hire a headman to kill my grandmother. You know what? It cuts down on the wedding list, Nick. <laughs> right. oh my God. All that stuff is a lot. The invitations, the place cards, right. all those things, they, they're, they require a lot of attention. I say just kill them all. So I guess my aunt called the hitman or hired a hitman. And was How did she, what did she do? Call like 1-800-HITMAN? Listen, there is a website <laughs> like that. I heard someplace, and we'll research it for an upcoming show. <laughs> but apparently there's a website like that, Okay. <laughs> My God! I need to off my grandmother. <laughs> so my aunt called this hitman or hired a hitman and was being really loud about it. And my uncle overheard this and was like, "Oh, oh this God. is not good." She was being loud, no less. She exactly. Like, she she called out from a window to the neighbor across the street, "Hey, Mary, put a hit out on Grandma." What? <laughs> Instead of calling the police like a normal person, he called his sister and said, "I think a crime has to be has been committed." So with, so as, so his sister, being of sound mind, called the police immediately, and the police intervened, and my grandmother is still alive, and she's fine. So nobody hit her? No. Nobody got the hit? Madison nobody. goes on to say that her aunt is not in jail, but her family is building a case against her, you think? Oh, come on now. But the, did the aunt actually follow through? She, she got the, uh, she got the uh, attention of a hit man? She did, and it didn't she go She paid through. him? She gave him funds? The details right now are, are sketchy, but they said the wedding was in a couple of weeks, according based on the time. Maybe he was a senior hitman, and he just he couldn't like catch up with her because he had a walker, and you can't shoot and use the walker at the same time. No, he can't, unless he's James <laughs> Bond. Right? Yeah, you know he tried to get the grandmother once because she had those uh, little yellow tennis ball hairs all over her head from him hitting her with a walker. <laughs> The fuzz from the tennis balls. He's like, you slow down, you stupid. I listen, you. Granny. So listen, so the wedding is in two weeks. He so tried my... to shoot her, but he couldn't load the ball and the ammo fast enough, <laughs> backing it down. These things work better when I was with Washington at Waterloo. So here's the thing. So she yeah, said, Waterloo. I got to move the <laughs> Waterloo. What are you, an ABBA fan? She said the wedding's in two weeks, and my grandma is still sad that she's still not invited. Oh, no. So, you know they're going to perform the hit that night. The original video, you know by the exactly way. exactly where she is. She's home, and everybody else is at the wedding. They all have an alibi. That's right. The original video, by the way, was watched over 1.7 million people and garnered thousands of likes and comments. Oh, my God. So, um, wouldn't that just be easier? Just Do We know the grandmother's it? name. No, we don't. The name has not been revealed for the sake of her safety. Uh, because how old is the grandma? 86? Eighty-five years old. Eighty-five. Yeah, that's a pretty cheap hit, I guess. It is. You don't even have to use a bullet. You just push it down. 
<laughs> wow. No. But let, let's just get out of here before we get into further trouble. You push trouble. her down and you choke her with a safety button. <laughs> I've fallen and I can't get up. Sit down, Grandma. Uh, what are you saying, Miss? <laughs> That's all the time. He's choking, he's choking on the same Before the authorities show up, this is all the time we have for this week's episode of Totally Useless he Information. Used it, he used it as a crude way of suffocating her. With Nick and Roy, we thank you very much for listening and, and continuing to listen. We really appreciate it. We scour the internet. You made a deposit. It might depend. <laughs> scour the internet and other sources to get useless information for you guys next time oh my god until then go on the website tell everybody say listen to this show because if you don't we're gonna get a hit out on you <laughs> <laughs> and her name is granny i'm yeah, good we did with granny right? yeah. <laughs> i'm nick and i'm roy thanks for listening totally useless information with nick and roy is a production of nickandroy.com. Visit nickandroy.com to access the full library of episodes or wherever you get your podcasts.